America's 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth in 1865. Nine people were brought to trial. Five were imprisoned. Four were hanged. Only circumstantial evidence convicted the conspirators. Was justice done? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Lincoln assassination historian, Professor William Hanchett. Lincoln has been our most beloved president, and that means that we don't fully appreciate that at the time during the Civil War, he was also our most hated president. Uh, <clears throat> and he was hated for two things. He was hated, first of all, for one of the things that he's most honored now, for freeing the slaves. But pro-slavery people, and Booth was certainly pro-slavery, thought that this was a terrible thing for the United States. The second thing for which uh, Lincoln was hated by many people was uh, his suppressions of civil liberty. So when Booth called Sick Semper Tyrannus, after he shot Lincoln and jumped to the stage at Ford's Theater, he really believed that he was killing a tyrant. And, you know, killing a tyrant is no crime or no sin. During World War II, we would have uh, respected somebody who killed Adolf Hitler. And many people, Booth among them, thought of Lincoln as we thought of Hitler. John Wilkes Booth, a renowned actor in the South, sought worldwide fame that would last throughout history. An opportunity arose during the Civil War to serve both his ego and his beloved Confederacy with one dramatic act. September 1864, the plot was born. It wasn't a conspiracy to assassinate from the beginning. Uh, sometime late in the summer uh, of 1864, Booth got the idea of uh, kidnapping Lincoln and holding him ransom for the uh, Confederate prisoners in the uh, United States prisoners of war camp. And he approached two of his boyhood friends, Samuel Arnold and Michael O'Loughlin, about it. They thought it was a feasible thing to do. Lincoln frequently drove around Washington without an escort. At least at Lincoln least. historian and author of Murder at Ford's Theater, Seth. Mr. James O. Hall. Now, I rather think that uh, Booth was handed the kidnap plot in Boston about the end of uh, July, 1864, because he met there with three Confederate agents. Now, what they talked about, no one knows. But immediately after that, he started gathering together the people who would help him uh, kidnap the president. And they had a meeting on the night of the 15th of March in which they were going to discuss this. They had this meeting at Gautier's restaurant on Pennsylvania Avenue. Booth, being in the theater, concluded that uh, the kidnapping of Lincoln just had to be sensational. So he was going to kidnap him in Ford's theater. They all gathered together and got a little drunk and got into an argument about how they were going to kidnap Lincoln. Arnold said he'd have no part of kidnapping a man in Ford's theater, and O'Loughlin said it was suicide. But Booth insisted. The thing never came off, of course, in Ford's theater. March 17, 1865, a kidnap attempt was made. Booth learned that Lincoln was going to attend a matinee performance of Still Waters Run Deep at the soldier's home on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. Historical reports are mixed on what really happened. This version is based on lectures given by John Surratt, one of the conspirators. Booth led two of his men out of the city toward the hospital. They were armed and prepared to confront Lincoln's carriage during its return to Washington.
Choosing a secluded spot on a deserted stretch of road, Booth left his men with instructions to await his signal for ambush, then rode out to track the carriage. As he prepared to give the signal, Booth discovered that the occupant of the carriage was not Lincoln, but Chief Justice Salmon P. Chase. Booth rode off and raged at his failure. Later, he was to learn that Lincoln had stayed in Washington and delivered a battle flag to the governor of Indiana from a balcony of the National Hotel. It was the hotel where Booth lived. Then there was a change in Booth's plans, um, and I think it's probably fair to date it on April 11th, uh, <clears throat> when Booth, in company with David Harold, who was one of the members of his group, and Louis Payne, another uh, member, attended a lecture at the White House. And during this speech, Lincoln said that he was going to urge that some black men be given the vote. And Booth was outraged at this suggestion. And he turned to Payne right then and said, shoot him. And of course, Payne refused to do that. But uh, uh, <clears throat> then he turned to David Harold, the other companion, and said, that's the last speech he'll ever make. So it's possible that then uh, Booth did decide, if opportunity arose, that he would kill Lincoln. So you see, whether uh, the kidnapping plot just came over into a plot to murder, whether it was one conspiracy or two, you have to remember this, that any time anyone plans to kidnap a president of the United States, they must be prepared to kill. And they had armaments uh, in the kidnapping plot. So it, it could be that uh, this plan to kidnap Lincoln just drifted naturally in Booth's fanatical mind into a plot to murder. April 14th, Booth knew that Lincoln would attend Ford's Theater that evening. He met with members of his group still in Washington. It was only at this meeting that he told them that he was going to assassinate the president. And he gave Payne the assignment of killing Seward. Uh, he told Atzerodt to get Andrew Johnson. You see, Booth's plan was a massive conspiracy against the leadership of the government of the United States. The president, the vice president, the secretary of state, the secretary of war, and the general in chief. He may have believed that by killing the leaders of the United States, the Confederacy could still win its independence. On April 13, 1865, Booth wrote in his journal, for six months we had worked to capture, but our cause being almost lost, something decisive and great must be done. Though only a few of Booth's co-conspirators would now be involved in this plot to murder, everyone he had touched in the previous months would be tainted with guilt. John Wilkes Booth, self-appointed leader. Lewis Payne Powell, held prisoner by the Union. George Atzerodt, ferrying contraband across the Potomac. David Herald, a rather dull youth who followed Booth blindly. Michael O'Loughlin, Confederate deserter and boyhood friend of Booth. Edmund Spangler, stagehand at Ford Theater. Samuel Arnold, Booth's schoolmate, former Confederate soldier. 8.30 p.m. April 14th, Lincoln is seated in his box at Ford's Theater. 9.30, Booth rides up Baptist Alley behind Ford's Theater, dismounts, and calls for Spangler to hold his horse. Instead, a boy, Peanut John Burrow, responds. Booth enters backstage and crosses to the adjoining Star Saloon. There, he orders whiskey and waits as the rest of the plot unfolds throughout the city. Ten o three. Payne gains access to Secretary of State Seward's home. Seward was severely wounded, but would live. Payne had failed. Booth was determined to succeed. Booth 
enters the theater from the front, climbs to the balcony, crosses to the president's box. Being familiar with the play, he knows at exactly what point there will be sustained laughter and applause. Dr. John Latimer, historian, physician, and ballistics expert. The actual pistol that uh, Booth used to shoot uh, President Lincoln uh, was uh, one like this, uh, called a Derringer. A Derringer is a short barrel gun firing a very large ball, and the velocity and the energy are very fatal if fired directly into the head. Being a single shot pistol, of course, was useless after this fired its shot, and Booth then threw it down and uh, pulled out his hunting knife, and uh, when the Major uh, Rathbone that was in the box with him grappled with him, he stabbed him uh, uh, badly in the arm. Uh, the Major uh, staggered back, and Booth went over to the edge of the box and vaulted over onto the stage 12 feet below, a flamboyant, dangerous type of action that did indeed result in his breaking one of the small bones in his leg just above the ankle. Booth ran from the theater and began his desperate drive towards freedom. He exited the alley with members of the audience in pursuit, rode down F Street, and across the Navy Yard Bridge into the Maryland countryside. Booth went to Sopper's Hill to await David Harold. Harold was to lead Payne out of the city, but for reasons never explained, he arrived alone. From Sopper's Hill, they went to Surrattville, arriving at the Surratt Tavern around midnight. Here, they were to pick up carbines, whiskey, and a pair of spy glasses. Mary Surratt, one of the accused conspirators, allegedly delivered these glasses for Booth on the morning of the assassination. 4 a.m., April 15th. Booth and Harold arrive at the home of Dr. Samuel Mudd. It is known that Mudd was acquainted with Booth. Whether he knew of Booth's deed remains a question. The broken leg was set and the boot was left behind. It was to become a damning piece of evidence. April 26th, federal troops captured Harold and cornered Booth at Garrett's farm. They set fire to the barn to smoke him out. The barn was brilliantly illuminated uh, they could all see Booth very clearly. And Booth came back first towards the corner of the barn, and Booth then decided that he couldn't fight the blaze and started towards the front door with his crutch and a very heavy Spencer carbine, uh, fully loaded, uh, in one hand. And as he went towards the front of the barn, he pulled out one of his revolvers from his belt, and almost immediately a, a pistol shot rang out. And down went Booth, a shot through the neck. Then they dragged him out and up to the back porch of the farmhouse, and he uh, died within about two hours. The uh, cry then went up, who shot him? Because, you know, they certainly wanted to capture him and have him for uh, testimony, and uh, here he was dead. And the man that stepped forward was Boston Corbett. One of the great questions is whether Boston Corbett actually shot John Wilkes Booth or whether Booth committed suicide. We know that the bullet hole through John Wilkes Booth's neck went slightly downhill, and we knew the bullet came in from his right, went downhill, going to the left. Now, this enormous pistol, if you try to shoot yourself that way in the neck, uh, you find that your arm isn't long enough. Uh, to make it easy to do in this manner, and they surely would have seen him do it, uh, you have to switch it around and you have to use your thumb uh, if you're gonna do this in order to press the trigger and in order to make it uh, in the, create the kind of wound that uh, Booth had. So it seems very unlikely just on that basis alone that he shot himself. And if you're gonna shoot yourself, you know, shoot yourself in the side of the neck would be the last place you would wanna do it because you might miss. The question was asked, was it really Booth who had been shot? At the autopsy, Dr. Woodward took some pains to be sure who he was autopsying. Uh, he had witnesses in who identified uh, Booth, and uh, he then uh, described on Booth's hand uh, his initials, which Booth himself had tattooed on them uh, as a child in a scraggly uh, childish scrawl, but which were undoubtedly his. 
Booth was buried in the old penitentiary. Another Booth was publicly dumped in the Potomac. Why? Secretary of War Edwin Stanton may have ordered this charade to dissuade grave robbers. He was to be questioned for many of his policies following the assassination. He had taken the reins of a crippled government, ordered hasty arrests of seemingly innocent people, rapidly convened a military trial, and ordered the prisoners to be held under tortuous conditions. Nobody ever accused Stanton of, of involvement in the assassination until Otto Eisenschimmel published that preposterous book, Why Was Lincoln Murdered, in 1937. Uh, <clears throat> it's a, 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 almost a criminal case of loading the dice against Stanton, uh, taking every uh, circumstance, uh, the, the most innocent ones, and giving them sinister implications. Uh, for example, it's frequently said that because Stanton ordered the men prisoners to be hooded so that they couldn't talk, that he was afraid that they would implicate him in the assassination. And this has been repeated time after time as one of the best indications that Stanton had something to hide. But it's ridiculous. The Stantons and the Lincolns were close to each other. Lincoln and Stanton respected each other. And you see, the, the misfortune is that in recent years, since 1937, it's just the exact opposite which has become known. Atzerodt arrested April 14th. Michael O'Loughlin, Edward Spangler, and Samuel Arnold arrested April 17th. Trial historian Edward Steers. The trial was hampered by very serious legal questions, principal of which was due process. Military tribunals and commissions, unfortunately, didn't really represent uh, defendants' peers. And the rules of evidence were markedly changed during a military tribunal and commission. That's not to say that the outcome would have been any different than it was had they been tried in a civil court in the District of Columbia. But uh, needless to say, it caused a great deal of um, difficulty. Mary Surratt may have been convicted only to serve as bait for her son John, a primary suspect. The Surratt Society was formed to preserve her memory. Society President Joan Chaconis. There were actually three things that convicted Mrs. Surratt, I suppose, in the trial. One was the fact that she knew Booth. Her son introduced his mother to the actor John Wilkes Booth. He would come to the house to visit the son. If the son wasn't there, then he'd stop and chat with the ladies. And of course, this was all brought out during the trial that Booth was there and if he didn't talk with the son, John, then he was talking to Mrs. Surratt, and what did they talk about? Whether she knew exactly what he was doing is questionable. However, if you were a mother today with a teenage son, you might have a suspicion that he's doing something that possibly he shouldn't be doing, but you probably don't think it's going to come to any evil or any harm. The second thing was Lewis Thornton Powell, the fellow who was told by Booth to go and kill the Secretary of State Seward. Well, unfortunately for Mrs. Surratt, just as the soldiers are at her house downtown questioning her about the whereabouts of her son, John Jr., and John Wilkes Booth, who should come knocking at the door but Lewis Thornton Powell and the soldier in the house, detectives, they enter the door and wonder, what, what, who is he? What's he doing here? And he says, well, he came here because Mrs. Surratt wanted him to dig a ditch for him, for her, the next next morning. This seemed very strange, and Mrs. Stratt was called to come out here and identify this man, and she said she didn't know who he was. The most damning evidence came from John Lloyd, keeper of the Surratt Tavern. The um, evidence that John Lloyd gave was that Mrs. Surratt gave him a message to have some shooting irons ready. Some people were coming by later to pick him up, and she gave him a package to deliver to those same people. Whether she knew what was in the package, this supposedly contained Booth's spy glasses. She didn't know what was in that package. These are all things that are based on circumstances, and there's nothing really, no concrete evidence to show that she really had anything to do or any knowledge that Booth was planning to kill the president. Five members of the commission met and signed a clemency plea on behalf of Mary Surratt asking Johnson to commute her sentence to life imprisonment. Holt maintains that on July 5th, when he presented the findings to Johnson, he also showed him the clemency plea, and that Johnson ignored it or turned it down. 
Johnson maintains that he never saw the clemency plea and was totally unaware of it and upheld the final sentences as recommended by the commission. July 7th, 1865. The hangman was getting tired of taking this very stiff rope and making eight turns on every one of the men's knots. And by the time he got to Mrs. Surratt, since he didn't think it would be used, he only put five turns on her knot. And uh, then, to his uh, horror, the knot was indeed used to hang her. Mary Surratt became the first woman to be hanged by the federal government. Did Booth go to Dr. Mudd's only for medical assistance? Some say Mudd also gave provisions. This could not be proven. Mudd was sentenced to life in prison on evidence that Booth's knee-high boot was found at his home. How many others were convicted on circumstantial evidence? It was the government's position that all of these individuals participated in the conspiracy to varying degrees, but all of them shared equally in the guilt of the murder of President Lincoln. Stanton, when he issued his order uh, on May 6th, charging the formation of the military commission, had used the phrase uh, that the commission was to remove the stain of innocent blood from the land. And I think, in fact, that's what the final sentencing was doing. Were the right people brought to trial? Could others have conspired to kill Abraham Lincoln? John Wilkes Booth pulled the trigger in the assassination of Lincoln. There was a conspiracy involved. Some of the details of that conspiracy may for all time remain cloaked in mystery.